you should never waste a bear market. Uh -huh. You should study in the bear market so that when a bull market really comes, you are in demand, you know your opportunities, and you're actually able to take the opportunities. Most people cannot take them. Why? Because they are not active during the bear market. You gotta be active during the bear market so that you can take all opportunities in the bull market. Hey, stop stealing my trading strategies. If you want to build your own trading strategies, predict, learn, and earn Bitcoin with zero risk, definitely have a look at our community app. It's tons of fun. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonite's special edition at Davos. And we're here live from the Blockchain Economic Forum. And guess what, guys? We have an amazing guest, someone we featured on our very first video as the top 10 crypto YouTubers of 2019. And it'll probably be the same in 2020. An awesome guy here, Ivan on Tech. Good to have you, Good my to be friend. Here. Good to be here. Wow. Thank you for the invitation and uh, looking forward to the discussion with you. Man, you, <laughs> Ivan, you're my sunshine every morning. <laughs> <laughs> 9 o'clock, 8 a.m. 8 a.m. So, <laughs> <Eight a. M. laughs> so wake up, you know, I had a bad night. I wake up with you <laughs> super energetic with your coffee and your notebook. No yes, yes, yes. Oh, That's man. how it is. Love what you've been doing. You've inspired so many people across the globe and educated so many people. And Thanks. Thank you so much for your great contribution. Thank you. Thank you. So my first question, my friend, you had the chance to be a developer and engineer in the off chain world. You could have yes. worked for some big safe companies with maybe uh, interesting streams of revenue, but you decided to go towards the blockchain decentralized space. What was that big why that pushed you and think, you know what, yes. I'm going to go for this. That's a good question. And it's true because when you are in crypto and you are full time in crypto, it's a, a big opportunity cost and you're taking a big risk at the end of the day. Because if crypto fails, then you've spent three, four years doing something that is irrelevant. So it's completely correct that really I, I was a programmer but since I was nine. I went to university to become an engineer. I went to computer science. And um, uh, at the end of my degree, my goal was to go to big tech, work there, maybe then, then later do some startup. Uh, but then I ended up in crypto. Why? Because I really saw the future, the potential, and um, the fact that there was so much to do for me. I saw my own place in crypto. And uh, because I believe in it so much, uh, I take the risk. I mean, it is a risk that that we take when we go all in crypto, full-time crypto. Also, uh, we employ people at our company. So for example, when we develop the academy or when we produce the YouTube channel, I have employees, so that's a risk as well. But at the end of the day, it's worth it because in crypto, you have asymmetrical risk. Yes, we all take risk, but the downside is very small. The upside is basically unlimited. So for me to, to take the risk that maybe crypto you know, won't be big, which I don't believe, but look, there is a chance that it won't be big. There is always a chance that uh, something will not succeed. Uh, to me, that's, that's a very, very good risk to take because the upside is so much bigger. And uh, that's why, that's really why. And you gotta do that analysis. <laughs> and I think if you really do it, most of the people who really take the time will come to a conclusion that crypto is the place to be. And you always want to be part of new industries that are not established. Because when everyone in the world already knows that the technology is good, it's useful, it's going to be big, there is no opportunity. Everyone today knows that internet is important. Everyone knows that the Google and Apple are important companies, but there is no opportunity in buying Apple stock today. You got to buy when most people don't know. So that is why crypto is so beautiful. It's big, it's important. Most people don't believe in it today, which means that all opportunities are here. And thank God most people don't believe in it today because otherwise there would be zero uh, opportunity and zero things to do here. That's so, that's amazing. So was it the technology, the ide ideology? Like, was it a combination? You saw yourself, you could picture yourself, I'm going to be doing that. What, what, what specific So, so I, I came from a technology uh, background. And for me, the technology was what really drove me and what really made me study a lot because I was wondering how can you have a currency that is on the internet that nobody controls and where you cannot cheat. There's no way to copy paste Bitcoin. So I came from the tech side. Other people come from the ideological side. Other people come from an economy side. Other people come from whatever other reason. There are so many different reasons for you to be in crypto. Maybe you work with NGOs. Maybe you work with finance. Maybe you work with fundraising. Whatever you do, there is always some kind of path to crypto. And that is why crypto is so big and it attracts so many different people from many different industries. There is something for everyone. But for me, it was a 
the technology. I just wanted to understand how can it work? <laughs> how does blockchain work? How does Bitcoin work? And that was in 2013. That is when I really discovered Bitcoin. And since then, it's been studying. And really, I entered the community in 2013 and we saw a bear market. So 14, 15, it was a bearish time. And that was the perfect time to study and learn because when the bull market then came in 2017, uh, there were so many opportunities and uh, there wouldn't be that many opportunities for me if I only then started to get into crypto. So that is why you should never waste a bear market. You should study in the bear market. You should try to see where this industry is going in a bear market so that when a bull market really comes, you are in demand, you know your opportunities and you're actually able to take the opportunities because opportunities are for everyone who can take them. Most people cannot take them. Why? Because they are not active during the bear market. You gotta be active during the bear market so that you can take all opportunities in the bull market. That's really good advice. So while you were studying all these different blockchains, like what is the type of criteria as a developer or yes. programmer that you're trying to look for when you find this is a good blockchain? Are there any specific of like, course, tools yeah. that you use? I mean, the only real one that matters is censorship resistance. Censorship resistance is the one that matters. Everything else is secondary. So m many people t talk about scalability, transactions per second, and while it's important, it's not the main thing because PayPal is quick. You have uh, credit cards, they're very quick. But that's not uh, what's important. What's important is censorship resistance and permissionlessness and uh, access, global access. That is most important in, in all blockchains. So the big question everyone needs to ask themselves when looking at the project is, is it censorship resistant or not? So that's the really the, the core criteria the, where you're the like... Only, really, the only criteria, is it censorship resistant or not? And then after that, of course, you can talk about scalability and features and well, languages, for example, does the blockchain have a Turing complete or, or Turing incomplete language and all other things. But the base layer is just, is it resistant or not to censorship? That's really interesting. And was the smart contract one of the biggest advancements in terms of the blockchain? Or did you see any other specific technological improvements where you're like, that is interesting? Well, for me, yes. A smart contract was absolutely very, very interesting because it took my blockchain interest to a whole new level. I got into crypto in 2013 and I started studying a lot, a lot. And then Ethereum came in 2015. And that is where I, as an engineer, really got a whole new level of excitement because now I can actually program fully fledged applications on top of a blockchain network. With Bitcoin, you can do scripting. I mean, you can, but it's very limited. The language is not Turing complete. And when it's not Turing complete, you cannot uh, do anything you would like to do as a developer. There are some constraints. So that's the biggest thing. And uh, after that, when Ethereum came, I started to study Solidity, uh, started to get this concept of a smart contract, why it's important, what is the use cases of smart contracts, and uh, really took the time to educate myself because it was during the bear market. So it was a very good opportunity to really take the time, relax in terms of not being stressed that, hey, it's a bull market, I gotta do something now, now, now. You have bear market, you have time, but also keep in mind that it's the time to study, to take position, to take market, market shares so that when bull market comes, you can use it. You can use it and you can help the community and you can also uh, be useful and you can uh, get all the opportunities that you can capture. Being useful like you and teaching people how to program smart I mean, contracts. Whether, you whether know? It's, so for me, it was education. Mm -hmm. uh, I just noticed through YouTube that people understand when I explain things. Uh, when I started YouTube, my English was very bad, yet people still watched and I thought, hey, maybe I have this uh, uh, talent for education. So I kept going. Uh, for other people, it's building businesses, building companies that are, you know, applications, wallets, exchanges. There are so many different things you could do. Also, wealth management, another important aspect. Look, there is, I can promise everyone who is watching, there is some person in your local community who is wealthy. They might not even understand how to sign up on Binance. So, look, there are so many low-hanging fruits. If you just are seen in your local community, if, if people know that you know about Bitcoin, they know that you know about crypto, I think just there you have a lot of low hanging fruits to get full time into crypto. So for example, that wealthy person, they might reach out to you because it's basically the only person they know locally that can help them get some exposure to crypto. And you can take a cut, you can take a commission, whatever you do, you can make a deal with them. And I've seen it happen over and over again. Yeah, Some yeah. guy that knows how to sign up on Binance, now he's a wealth manager <laughs> because this industry is so new. And if you just know a bit, you know more than uh, you know 99% of people. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so don't underestimate it how much there is to do.
and uh, be seen, be known in your community or online. But when people think about Bitcoin or blockchain, they need to be thinking about you in your local community. So organize meetups, organize events, uh, somehow get your name out there in order to get opportunities. That's the only way, yeah. That's definitely the only way. It's all about the community, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and so you just mentioned Ethereum. So as you know, Ethereum 2.0 is kind of a big topic these yeah. days. Yeah. And a lot of people are battling on proof of work, proof of stake, you know, different yes, consensus yes, 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 mechanisms. Yes, yes. Like you you really understand this to the T. Yes. Like what type of consensus mechanism do you kind of favor as of today? Yes. Or is it more pros and cons? I, I favor proof of work. Uh, and the reason is because proof of work it's so simple, so powerful, and it's truly connecting blockchain to energy. You spend energy in order to fuse blocks together. There is no way to unfuse the blocks. I mean, you cannot do it without spending more energy. <laughs> so, so it's, and you cannot do it with proof of stake. Look, I, I get the reasoning of uh, Ethereum Foundation and why they're moving to proof of stake. And I think uh, Ethereum 2.0 is going to be very important and exciting. And proof of stake will do a lot of great things. For example, the fact that we can lower the inflation on Ethereum, that's a big one. Uh, but in terms of uh, this block fusing and the, in terms of building a blockchain that is censorship resistant, that is secure, I'm leaning more towards proof of work because that one is it's such an amazing uh, system. I mean, I think the biggest thing that Satoshi did, it is using proof of work for consensus because proof of work is really an old concept. It was here before Bitcoin. Proof of work initially was used for email. Maybe it was used for something else, but the earliest use case I know of is email. And that is when you send an email, you need to do a small calculation so that you spend some energy so that you don't spam. Ah. So that was the first, according to my understanding, maybe some other use case was before that, but uh, the way I see it is that was the first one. Then Satoshi took that and he said, okay, in order for you to produce a block on the Bitcoin blockchain, you need to sp spend electricity and you need to have skin in the game. Because when you spend electricity, you mine the block, you spend a lot of money, you want to get the reward, meaning that you want to be honest, because if you are dishonest, you will not get the block reward. The nodes will reject your block. But if you're honest, if you're helping the network, you're playing by the rules, you will get the block reward and transaction fees. So that is how in proof of work, you incentivize miners to be honest at the same time through hashing, you really fuse blocks together. So I favor proof of work a bit more <laughs> to, this <laughs> to this day. It's a fabulous <laughs> use case of game theory as well. You know, the yes, whole yes. ecosystem and how everyone's incentivized. Well, uh, it is, yes, it is game theory and proof of stake is even, I mean, it's even more game theory. More We're game moving theory. a bit away from this because I, I think proof of work, it's, you know that the only way for someone to cheat is to have more, more uh, hash power and more computer power than anyone else. That is the only way. In proof of stake, it's more like game theory, like who is going to vote, who is going to act in different ways. It's not really the this, you know, simple energy. It's not really this simple, you know, we just hash a bunch of times and then whoever guesses the correct hash by spending electricity wins. So it's a bit more like game theoretic. Uh, but I get the point why, why they're doing it and I think for Ethereum it makes sense. It makes sense to go proof of stake. But for digital gold and for Bitcoin, uh, it doesn't. So doesn't, uh, it yeah. will be forever proof of work in my view. Yeah, that's awesome. Great, great. And speaking of proof of work, I heard recently that there are some countries like Kuwait where you can mine a Bitcoin for $1,500. Like in some countries okay, where yeah, subsidized. Yeah, yeah. It's, yes, it's, yes, yes, yes. So a lot of people are worried about that, right? The price right. of... I mean, uh, look, I think it's Kazakhstan. Uh, uh, just recently, I, I read this, that they are subsidizing electricity and miners come and then <laughs> they start mining. <laughs> Like, but yeah. the government tries to outlaw these uh, mining operations that use subsidized electricity, because obviously subsidized electricity is for population; it's not for <laughs> it's not for miners. Um, so yes, uh, th that's true. But uh, it doesn't really matter what the price is in terms of mining, because the price goes down, people shut down machines, difficulty goes down, mining difficulty. So there is no way that you know Bitcoin will just freeze if the price drops. It's not like how it works. People speak about this minor downward evil spiral that yeah, price goes down yeah. and then miners stop mining and blockchain is just turn still. off other machines and all no that one's gonna do that no one's there gonna is always that, yeah. someone who's still making a bit of profit Absolutely. and when that still happens you see difficulty adjusting so bitcoin has survived under 1k under 100 you know 
really the price can go down and Bitcoin will still work. So I mean, even BitTorrent or Pirate Bay and all these things, they get shut down, another one yeah, turns yeah, on right, the, right, right, the server. Yes, There's yes. always someone, right? Yes, to... someone will always be mining. There's an incentive to always mine. Exactly, exactly. So we talked about Ethereum 2.0. That's the perfect transition for yeah. DeFi, my yeah, friend. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah, made right. a video about this. We'll put a link uh, in, the, sure. in, the, in, the, in the description below. But DeFi is such a huge word, it's not big. only 2019, even 2020. Big, yeah. Um, is this kind of like the typical cycle of overhype? Are we a little bit overdoing it? Or is it really what we believe it will be? What is your take as of today, the pros and cons? Uh, but look, I, I don't think it's overhyped. Why? Because most people don't have any DeFi. They, they, they don't have any funds in DeFi. Uh. <laughs> so overhype would be if people start throwing money at DeFi, expecting some kind of return or some kind of you know speculative gain, quick money. Yeah. DeFi is not really like that. It doesn't work like that. People who use DeFi, they actually need the product. They, that's, the, that, that's the big difference between ICOs and ICO hype and DeFi hype. Because DeFi hype is about the fact that people want to, for example, get some um, uh, fiat for their crypto without selling it. Yeah. Because when you sell uh, crypto to fiat, you might have huge gains and your government will tax you. Instead, you lock it into uh, DeFi you get a stable coin, you basically create the CDP alone and you get stable coin and then you can convert that stable coin to dollars. And because there is no difference in price between the stable coin and the dollar, you have no gain. You just have a loan and you can then spend your uh, fiat for em emergency expenses or maybe you want to do something with fiat. Basically, if you need fiat, but you don't want to sell your crypto, DeFi is your friend. That is how you can get uh, uh, fiat for your crypto. Then you also have derivatives, you have these decentralized exchanges, you have Uniswap, there are so many protocols building. And there is no way for you to really speculate. I mean, yes, some protocols have tokens, but most of the hype we're seeing in DeFi, and when you see the, uh, the amount of assets, amount of uh, Ether that is being locked into DeFi go up, it's not because people are speculating. Because look, you cannot spec. You, you can just use DeFi, and when yeah. you use DeFi, you lock in funds and the, the, the passive uh, income, right? Passive interest. income is, is a good exam example yeah. with Compound, for example. Yes, and um, therefore I don't see any, you know, uh, dumb money, so to speak. Money who doesn't know what DeFi is, they just throw money at it because it's a hype. Because you cannot do it. You can just use the product. So what we're seeing is actual adoption. Adoption. Yeah. This, if you go to DeFiPulse.com, I think you see how much money is being locked into DeFi and how it's growing exponentially, basically. And that's adoption, because that's the only way it can, it can grow, that people actually use DeFi. So I, I don't think it's, it's a hype. I think it's very important. In the future, you, in order to take a mortgage, you will go to your web browser, type in like, you know, uh, just like you type in HTTP to get information, to, to go to a website, there will be like, you know, lending and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, slash, slash, and then you get your lending protocol. You will get mortgage from the internet from internet lending protocols. And Compound is the, the early one. There will be others. The same with, with interest. When you want to get some cash, cash flow on your money, you also just lock it into DeFi. I think it will be very easy available through your browser. All the browsers will support it in the future. You don't need to have MetaMask, uh, but uh, right now you do need. But in the future, I think all of the big browsers will be integrating with blockchain DeFi because otherwise they will not be competitive. So it's, it's a big thing. I think DeFi is... Uh, is the biggest thing that has happened to crypto since, uh, maybe since Bitcoin, to be honest. Maybe since Bitcoin, because that is how Ethereum really showed yeah, that how was valuable the original, it. Yeah, the whole decentralized finance, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, and the because, white paper. And because from the beginning, Ethereum was yeah. just for ICOs, and people thought, hey, what is this? <laughs> is it only for ICOs? That's it. And uh, Ethereum didn't show itself until DeFi. So that's why I think that DeFi is this event. The, the growth of DeFi is maybe the the second biggest event after after Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is the first creation of Bitcoin and then growth of DeFi is the second big event. That's really interesting. So DeFi is an asset class and you have sub-asset classes. Is the lending... No, I, I wouldn't say that DeFi is an asset class per se. DeFi is uh, just decentralized applications that can uh, be used for finance. For finance. Yeah. Some of them have assets, like synthetics. They, there's an asset. There's a token. But many of them don't. So it's... Uh, it's well, just it's, a technology it's, without it's a token, It's just a technology right? without yeah. a token. That's, yeah. that's why I'm telling you that we don't really see a hype mm. that is unfounded because there's no way for you to really speculate in many of these things. But you can use them and then that... Uh, 
that uh, chart that shows how much money is being locked in, then it will go up. Yeah. It's already 3 million Ethereum right now, it's locked in? I don't know how many Ethereum, but it's like $300 million. Yeah, $300 into, million. Yeah, dollars, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's so that's a real <laughs> use case, right? And, and it went from zero in just one year ago. So it's one, two years ago, it was zero. Now it's 300 million. So it's exponential growth. That's fascinating. So a DeFi is definitely something you've talked about on your channel yeah, yeah. and it's a very exciting topic. So the Bitcoin halving is again, one of the big topics yeah, of 2020. Yeah, sure, sure. Have you heard of the, uh, there's a principle called the self-fulfilling prophecy yeah, yeah. The theory. You know how when too many people are aware of the news, yeah, yeah, it yeah. may alter the expected outcome. Yes. Do you think the halving will react the way it's been reacting in the past or because it's become such a mainstream yeah, topic, yeah things might change a bit. So I've been talking about on the channel, having in itself might be a dangerous event because so many people expect it to pump, yeah. which means that there are so many people in the space that are still here. They, they really have lost all the faith <laughs> because you know we've just been dropping from 14K. Uh, and uh, many of them are just here to see, you know, maybe it will pump after the halving. So it's a bit dangerous because if the, many of them will dump uh, if they get disappointed yeah. and they might get disappointed quickly also because there are so many people hyping up the halving. I think there are also some uh, some bears that might dump into that liquidity. Uh -huh. So, I mean, as always, there is, you know, uh, buy the rumor, sell the news. Yeah. So it, it, there's a good chance that the price will increase before the halving because people are excited. When the halving happens, that is when the bears start dumping because that, that is when you see so much liquidity to dump into. So if you want to sell a big position, you don't want to sell it now. You want to wait for, for buyers to come, yeah. for people to FOMO in. Because if, if you, let's say you have a big position, you want to sell it now, you will actually drive down the price. You will get slippage. So you will not be able to sell at current prices. You will sell, sell some Bitcoin at this price and then it will go down. So you will not be able to liquidate. But if uh, many people are buying, then it's perfect. So look, uh, I, I think halving itself is a bit dangerous, but a few months after halving, that's when the exciting that's when things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense, you know, a little bit different from how it's been behaving in the past, yes, like a yes, few yes. months later. Or... And the, also there's so much more money now that require that is required to move the prices in the same way. So there's this stock to flow model. Yeah. The stock to flow model really predicts exponential increase in price after each halving. Previously, it was easier because we went from like $2 to 100, from 100 to 1,000. Now we're basically going from thousands to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. And obviously the amount of capital required to go from right now 8K to maybe 50K is way more than to go from like $2 to Absolutely, $10. Yeah. So that's another yeah. factor. Interesting. Uh, but all in all, that's why we are in crypto. It's uncertain and it's also good that it's uncertain because if, once again, if it would be certain, everyone would be in crypto. Everyone and their you know, cousin will already be in crypto. So it's good, it's uncertain. Uh, but look at let, look at the fundamentals, look at the long term. For me, it's very clear that Bitcoin is going to be huge. Crypto is going to be huge. In the short term, it's all fun. But uh, let's look at the long term at the end of the day. I like your mindset because you're telling people to lower their expectations in case so they don't get too disappointed. Yeah, yeah, and, yes, right? yes, yes, yes. Because one year from now, two years from now, nobody can tell, really. There, there are many indications that uh, that we will see uh, new all-time highs soon. I, th I, I think so. But uh, whenever there is a prediction, it's always a probability. And there's always a probability that it will not go that way. So yeah, ju ju think about the long term. That's that's better for you. And your psychic, that's the thing. Psychic, and also pumping. And then right? you're <laughs> and do some pump, yeah. <laughs> that, was so that was so funny by the Andreas interview. I'm sorry, going back quickly to what you said about yeah. the, the digital dollar, RNB, many people are saying yeah, that the yeah, yuan yeah. might become you know, uh, completely like a cryptocurrency that uh, that anyone can access and say that it might be a threat for right, the US right, dollar right. as a global reserve. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that's the case or is it just a hype well, in the uh, media? Or? I don't know, going into the future, it's a good possibility that China will become the most important market in the world. Uh, they are over 1 billion, oh sorry, what is it, like 1.3, 1.3 billion? Like yeah. it's, it's so many people, it's way more than the US, more, way more than EU. And uh, now they're getting to a point where they are quite wealthy. I mean, the average Chinese is, uh, I mean, they have a middle class. So I think for all companies, I mean, today, the, the biggest market for most companies is the US. If, if, if you work in the EU, you somehow want to get to the US because it's the biggest market, the most wealthy market when it comes to just number of people. And if you establish your, yourself in the US and you're successful in the US, you have a multinational, multi-billion dollar corporation. So I think it's not impossible that in the near future, China will be the market for everyone. So wherever you are in the world, 
you need to be successful in China if you truly want to be this you know, multinational global company that has really succeeded. I think it's a good uh, possibility that it will be like that. And then EU and US will be more like interesting niche markets. Uh, so it, it does make sense to me that China will grow. It will be the most important market. Uh, and when it comes to the currency, that could follow. I mean, reserve currencies change all the time. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we're far away from that today. So it's, uh, the, the stakes are high. And uh, this, this uh, currency war between China and US today has just accelerated with the, the digital dollar announcement and, and uh, what we heard from Giancarlo. Yeah, that was a really interesting interview, by the way. We'll put a link. But you're, you're so right, because the whole China like factor, and some people are saying that they're already preparing virtual currency exchange licenses. Right, right, They right. say if that happens, with the Chinese money flowing in without needing a VPN or going through OTC, you know, ways to buy crypto that are yeah, yeah. a little bit difficult. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people say that would be a mega bull run if suddenly right. it becomes legal. Do, do you see that happening? or You mean normal crypto? I don't think so, to be honest, with China. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think, you don't think they will waive I, the ban? I, I, no? I, I, I think they've been very clear that it's blockchain, not crypto. Uh, uh, maybe they will change their mind. Sometimes you see them changing. <laughs> but it doesn't look like that right now. But their digital currency, I, I'm, it's certain that it's going to happen for sure. Awesome. And there's one last question I wanted to ask you. The whole blockchain trilama, you yeah, know, yeah, the security, yeah. scalability, yes. yeah, yeah. and decentralization, is that true, like as a programmer in tech, that you cannot have all three at the same time? You need to compromise? Yeah, there, you need to compromise. Yes. yes. It's true. I mean, then. Uh, that's why we have layer two solutions. That's why often when you see projects uh, claiming that they have, you know, 100,000 transactions per second, probably they've done some trade offs with decentralization. And that's a problem, it's a famous computer science problem. Uh, and so that's why you have layer two solutions and other ways to uh, split up the use cases. Because when you want the use case of a digital gold, like Bitcoin, you need the maximum security. Now, if you want to use a use case of uh, daily transactions, uh, then you might have a lightning network. Um, if you want to have a use case of DeFi, Ethereum is good. But uh, if you want to have a use case of, for example, blockchain games, Ethereum might not be that good because basically in Ethereum you have limited block space and your transaction is competing with other transactions. Now, in DeFi, you're dealing with applications that handle millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. So for someone who uses DeFi and they send a DeFi transaction, they might be okay paying $100 transaction fee because maybe they're, they're moving $10 billion or 10 million, whatever. So for them, $100 in transaction fee is very low. It's so cheap. Uh, but if you're build, building a blockchain game, you are not okay with that. Yeah. Like your transaction fee cannot be more than one cent, Absolutely. maybe one tenth or a hundredth of a, of, of a cent. So you cannot really build your game on Ethereum, to be honest with you, because your transactions will be competing with these big DeFi transactions. So in some, in some way, I see that it's important to, to think about your use case and pick the platform for that. So for example, for games, Tron or EOS, might be a better solution Ethereum, be because yeah. there you don't have this huge DeFi, uh, DeFi dApps and DeFi ecosystems that are okay with paying big transaction fees and you might be uh, better off there or maybe layer two on Ethereum or something else. So it's, it's important to keep it in mind for sure. Yeah. That's a really good thing. So, so in terms of the blockchain, Trilama or like you said, Trilama, yeah. Trilama um, second layer solutions are there to defeat second that layer purpose. And, uh, and side chains. And side chains. Yeah. Yeah. How, I mean, how, otherwise Bitcoin would be 100 million transactions per second if, they, if, if there wouldn't be any uh, trilemma in, in, in regards to, uh, to blockchain and security uh, and speed and decentralization. Yeah. Are, are you worried about quantum computing? Uh, I think it's actually going to happen. Quantum computers affect the uh, public-private key cryptography. So they don't affect hashing as much. Hashing is used for mining. So there's no way that you know, a quantum computer will just mine all Bitcoins this quickly because Quantum doesn't really help you with hashing. It helps a bit, but not to this large extent. But quantum computers can help you with cracking uh, public and private keys. So if I, if I have your public key, I could use a quantum computer to get your private key. Uh, and with a normal computer, that's not possible. But with quantum, it's possible. So maybe it's the case that in the future, we have to switch the, the ways we handle keys. And we just need to switch the format. It would require a hard fork, but... Uh, I think it's it's good to be thinking about it at the end of the day. It's good to be thinking about it. It might happen in five, ten, I, I don't know when, but it's going to happen. Technology is always moving forward. 
And some people in Bitcoin always claim that, hey, quantum is not a problem, we're cool, we're safe, it's gonna take a lot of time, but you never know, look, it's gonna be very quickly. Technology is always quick. So some people say that, hey, crypto is gonna grow quickly because it's a technology that is revolutionary. Well, and then they say quantum is not gonna, it's gonna be slow. But I think quantum <laughs> is, is, don't underestimate quantum. Look, it's, it's gonna be fast, it's gonna be big, and it's gonna affect all internet. And by the way, Bitcoin is maybe the, the smallest of the use cases right now because all banking, all e-commerce, everything that has to do with encryption will be affected. So Bitcoin right now, if you look at global population, might be one of the smaller use cases. Uh, but of course, it will also be affected. So maybe we will have to switch the key. Uh, because not, right now we're using elliptic curve cryptography for public-private keys. We might have to use something else. Uh, that's really interesting. So we still need to be careful, be aware, yeah, make so, sure that we're yes. building solutions to, to yes. counter that. Yeah. That's really interesting. And one last question, my friend. I'm sorry, yes. I had many last questions sure, today. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, since you are literally, to me, I see you kind of like the, the speakers, the giant speakers that <laughs> send out messages and have, has great influence on the community. Um, as you know, on Crypto Twitter these days, there's a lot of tribalism, people fighting. The yes. word scammer has been used very loosely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like how, in terms of these, this maximalism, how should we behave in order to, what's your take on this just in general or how can we avoid these? Well, uh, everyone is uh, a scammer <laughs> according <laughs> to someone. <laughs> Andreas Antonopoulos is a scammer. I know, according they call to, him a scammer. According to Bitcoin maximalist because he, he has written a book on Ethereum. Mastering Ethereum, yeah. yeah I mean, it's, uh, Vitalik is obviously a scammer <laughs> because he, he built Ethereum. Uh, but then you have uh, people calling Bitcoin maximalist scammers as well. Everyone is a scammer, so look, it doesn't mean anything in the space. Which is bad because there are real scammers as well. And uh, when you call out a scammer that is a real scammer, you don't get any attention because uh... everyone has been called a scammer. Yeah. So I think it's bad that scam doesn't mean anything in this industry. Uh, but it's also how it is. And uh, look, you, you can absolutely be maximalistic but you just lose an opportunity. So why would you do that? It's like bankers thinking that, uh, that Bitcoin's gonna fail and they're being maximalistic to their banking ecosystem. So I think that unfortunately too many people are like that as well in Bitcoin. And to be honest, they're only hurting themselves because look, during the past uh, few years, you would be way better off if you actually invested something in Ethereum or in uh, EOS or in something else. Look, there, you take more risk and for new, new newcomers, new, new people, it's better to be maximalist actually, and to be maybe just in Bitcoin and Ethereum and that's it. Uh, but if you stay like that and you learn more, you, you're just limiting yourself because look, there, there are many more opportunities outside of just Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's important to realize it. But you're also taking more risk because yeah. we've seen many exit scams, many ICOs that just run away. So at the end of the day, it's all about your risk tolerance and uh, what you're looking for. But the history is clear that you would be better off if you actually invested a bit in Ethereum when it was early. Uh, so I don't get maximalism too much. Look, I understand that we've seen many scams and I get it from that perspective, but it is just too, it's sounding too much like bankers to me. That hey, you know, if you are such, a, I, I see many, you know, these experts on television saying that Bitcoin is a scam and they are these experts. So, but man, if you are such an expert, how could, have, could you have missed the asset that went up 9 million percent yeah. over the last 10 years. I mean, what kind of experts are you if you've yeah. missed it? <laughs> yeah. You've had 10 years. Even if you got in, in the last five years, you would already make thousands of percent. So not only you missed millions of percent, you also missed, you, and, it's, and still you're telling me that Bitcoin is bad and a scam. And the same is with Bitcoin. Like, look, if you are such an amazing guru, how have you missed Ethereum's and, and Ethereum's rise as well from the ICO to now? So. Uh, you gotta be open-minded at the end of the day, but I, I get uh, that you gotta be protecting newcomers. Protecting, yeah, yeah. And it's better for newcomers to have the mindset that hey, Bitcoin and Ethereum and everything else is uh, questionable, until proven otherwise. Until proven otherwise. Yeah. I think that's really valid because you know if you use that word too much, you'll dilute. Yes, yes. And then you won't be able to call out the real scammers, and then people make it. And just like just what you do, like educating the community and sharing yeah, yeah, and yeah. spreading a message. Do something positive rather than you know calling yes, people yes, scammers. Yes. There are many good things. And you also use do. credibility because you call something a scam, then people realize, man, it went up. Like like the bankers and the financial advisors, they're calling Bitcoin a scam now for ten years, and people are seeing it's going up and up and up, and they've missed all the opportunity, and now they, they, they these advisors are the one that are the ones that are losing the reputation and credibility. One hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent, my friend. So Ivan, the Academy 
You yes. have an amazing course. It's it's a whole it's suit, a whole, it's a whole suit, platform. Whole it's, platform. It's Fifteen plus courses on development, on Bitcoin, on Ethereum, how prog how to program applications on on Bitcoin, on Lightning Network, and everything from scratch. You don't have to know anything. And really, LinkedIn pointed out that uh, blockchain is the number one high-paying skill 2020. LinkedIn did this research. So blockchain is the number one high-paying skill 2020. And 2020 is really the time to go full-time in crypto. This is really your chance. And it's right before the next bull market. It's right before the next, uh, the next explosion and the next uh, retail, retail wave that is coming into the space. So I, I think you definitely got to take action and work in this space. And our academy, we have 20,000 students. We do certification. You, you get certificate if you complete course and if, you, if we see that you know what you're doing. And the most uh, employers require certification. So we give you certification. We have 20,000 students. You don't need to know anything. Very easy to start. We guide you by the hand. So it's step by step. And it's, it's like Bitcoin. It's asymmetric uh, risk because you might not like it, but then you get uh, money back within 14 days. So basically, you have zero downside and you have unlimited upside. Oh. So go follow the link below and uh, join the Academy. We'll definitely have the link in the description. Yes. Ivan, we had you in the very first video mentioning you as the, <laughs> one of the trailblazers of the space. Now I get to meet you in person. Thank you so, Thank much, you so much, my friend. Thank you so much. And hopefully Appreciate get to see it. you have a good time here at Davos <laughs> for the rest of the week. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you.